Welcome to another edition of the official Jets podcast powered by Amazon Web Services, Ethan Greenberg, Eric Allen. We're hearing from Gus Bradley, the Raiders defensive coordinator on the pod today. Bradley worked with Robert Sala in Seattle. Then Gus Bradley takes a head coaching gig in Jacksonville, brings over Robert Sala. And who do they coach there in Duval County? Paul Pusluzny, the linebacker who used to play for the Bills, one of the best Penn State linebackers of all time. And that's actually in Jacksonville is where the all gas, no break mentality originated. Yeah, you're right about that. Before we get going on all gas, no break, the Penn State guys, part of our crew here at Jets 360, they got to be happy that Puzlesny <laughs> was all over our content here this week. I don't think folks at home know this, but how many guys do we have or have had who have some kind of Penn State ties? I mean, I think we A have at, le at least two to three full-timers, uh, a, a former social media a representative who now works with the Washington football team. He actually went to Penn State. The guy who is uh, the chief editor on the Emmy award-winning One Jets Drive, he's a Penn State guy. And the person who is the quarterback of the website and all of our content getting it up digitally, he's a Penn State guy. <laughs> there are a lot of Penn State guys. And the guy that edits, ed edits the coaches show, Penn State guy. Oh, it my can't God. can't wait. Penn State guy, same <laughs> guy, but there are a lot of Penn State representatives. I, I've been working with the Jets since 2016, and it feels like Penn State has the most alum within our department in that span. Historically, it's not even close. You want the Syracuse. <laughs> that's one of the best communication schools in the country. And uh, we've had a couple of people from Syracuse, the new house school, uh, myself, I'm a proud alum of the university of Florida. Everybody knows that, but I'm the uh, sole representative there, but uh, Penn state. Yeah. Paul Puzlesny, one of the top linebackers in the history of that school started his career inside the AFC East with the Buffalo bills. Then late in his career, obviously playing with the Jacksonville Jaguars, his linebackers coach was Robert Sala. And they came up with that mantra and it, they, it, Puzlesny told me that's something that they wanted to develop was a mantra. And they came up with all gas, no break. And it was a mentality, not just play fast, but also think fast. And that's what we've heard throughout this process in terms of the Jets finding their head coach and now us doing a lot of research on Salah. He wants guys to go out there on Sunday and have it simple for them and they just can go. And also, uh, you know, he was able to connect with not only the Jacksonville Jaguars uh, linebackers, but of course the San Francisco 49ers defenders and everybody inside the respective buildings he's been, he's been at. And Puzlesny was able to articulate that in our visit. And with Puzlesny, there were rumors floating out there that maybe Salah would want to bring on Pazlozny as a part of the coaching staff. That did not happen. As we're recording this Tuesday morning, the Jets have filled out a chunk of the staff. We know the coordinators on offense and defense and Mike LaFleur and Jeff Ulbrich, and they're still filling out the remainder of the staff. Yeah, and that's going to be announced, you would anticipate, sometime early this week. It's Tuesday while we're taping right now at about 11 a.m. Shoot. You might hear some more names uh, go out there here later this week, but you're right. It, those key positions, the offensive coordinator, we know Mike LaFleur's heading up the offense and Jeff Albrecht heading up the defense. Puzlesny, what is he doing right now? Uh, he's getting his MBA at Carnegie <laughs> Mellon. So that's a sharp dude uh, who went to Penn State. I think that's very true. And obviously, EA and I know the Super Bowl happened. We're going to talk about it after we hear from Gus Bradley and Paul Puzlesny. Actually, we're going to talk about what we can learn or what people across the league can learn in terms of evaluating the talent on both the Bucks and the Chiefs and how they can implement that and what kind of system fits the Jets might be looking for in free agency in the draft. Gus, thanks so much for joining us. And you've known Robert a long time, Coach Sala. So can you kind of take us back to where you first met him and what was your initial imp uh, impression of Coach Sala? You know, you know what? It was a while ago now. I think it was back in 2011 with the Seattle Seahawks 
we were looking for a quality control coach. And uh, he came up and interviewed for it. And uh, he, he did a great job in the interview. And I, I, he made me almost feel like I was a fool if I didn't hire him. You know, here we have this guy in the building for this long. And you're kind of looking for, all right, where's, where's his weaknesses? Where, you know, why isn't he qualified for the job? But uh, after visiting with him, it was a no-brainer. He met with Pete Carroll. And I think he was signed, sealed, and delivered, as they say, in no time. <laughs> so, you know, I've read a couple articles that said, that he attacked that job and what you just in just described with like some kind of essentially like a maniac attitude where he really dove into it. Can you kind of talk about what work entails as a quality control coach and the approach sure. that he brought? Well, it's just like everything, you know, up in Seattle, when we were there, coach Carroll's philosophy was always do things better than they've ever been done before. So he came into that mentality and that was his job as a quality control coach. Take what we've done in the past take it to another level, try to be more efficient in it. And he did the work of many now, and he really took that to heart. And I saw him compete in trying to make that quality control position something that, you know, has never been seen before, you know, in that building. And um, he did just a fabulous job. It entails breaking down film, you know, uh, different things that we asked him to do as far as getting players, the different formations and the notes that under each formation. And it requires a lot of organization, a lot of detail, and just being really efficient with your time. And um, I can say at the end of that period, it won me over enough that when I got the head job in Jacksonville to get him down there as a the linebacker coach. So just going off of that, what qualities does Coach Sala bring that made you at that time want to bring him with you to Jacksonville? Well, he's a student of the game, and you always want somebody that's got a little bit different personality than what you do. I think it's very important to have the mixture of personalities, and they had that. He had a unique way of, of really getting the information to the players, something that may at times seem complicated. He had the ability to make it simple and really share only the information needed for the players to be successful. Sometimes as coaches, we give them you know, all the information, and it can slow them down. It was just natural for him to do that. And really, you know, get them the information needed. I thought he did an outstanding job at that. And then he was an idea guy. I thought he always would try to take the system and tweak it just enough to try to stay ahead of the game. And, um, you know, I thought that's important as well as on a defensive staff. How did you see him grow from Seattle to Jacksonville and then from Jacksonville to where he is now as a coach? Well, I think when you have your own room, you realize, you know, relationships were always important to Robert, but I think the relationships with the players to build that trust and to really, you know, our job is to serve the players and to impact them, you know, impact their future, impact the organization as well. And I think, you know, when he had his own room, uh, he realized just how important that building that relationships and trust, he had an assistant coach that worked with him. And, uh, you know, so it wasn't just him. You know, he had another coach that he had to train underneath him. And I thought he did a good job mentoring him as well. So it really prepared him for his next step as a coordinator. Going back to Seattle for a minute, you worked under Pete Carroll. So did Coach Sala. You know, he said that Coach Carroll was, that was the first place where he really started to learn. And I think the anecdote he used was there's two types of way that you can be treated. You can either be the coffee guy or you can be, like a plant and be watered and see growth. So what kind of influence, you know, whether personal or, you know, just experience wise, do you think coach Carroll had on coach Sala? Well, I think, you know, what you see is what you get with coach Carroll, you know, every day I, at that consistency of what he brought into that building, uh, Robert saw that firsthand. Hey, it was a tough week. You knew how Coach Carroll was going to come in. He was going to be demanding. There was a standard. But his, the, his personality and his infectious personality stayed consistent. And I think Robert saw that, that that was so important for the players. Not at the point where don't get confused with uh, positively with not um, holding players accountable, though. He's a guy that really holds the players accountable. There's a standard that's, you know, it's non-negotiable. And uh, but with that, he's not a demeaning type coach. He's more of a, you know, he gets excited now when players do the right things and, and they execute things the, in, in the way that it should look. And I think a lot of that was carry over from Pete Carroll. You know, you kept bringing up the word standard and meeting the standard. Well, general manager Joe Douglas, before looking for the 20th head coach for the Jets, said one of the things that he wants to look for in a head coach is someone that has a clear vision and an identity for the team and sets a standard that says, when you meet it, this is what happens. And this is what happens when you do not. Obviously coach Sala hasn't been the head coach 
of an NFL team before, but what gives you the belief that he can be a successful one? It's a, it's a great question now, but you're right. There is a standard, and that's so much nowadays is not telling people what the standard looks like. It's showing them what it looks like. This is what the standard looks like. This is not what the standard looks like. And I think nowadays that's the, what the players are looking for. So Robert does a great job in that. But I think really where his biggest growth came uh, is obviously, you know, we had a great situation in Seattle and, and Jacksonville, great experiences there. But I, I think the biggest growth that took place for him was with Kyle and uh, John Lynch at San Francisco. I thought they did an outstanding job involving their coaches, especially Robert, in understanding the cap, understanding offense, understanding the game of football as far as how it works game management-wise, uh, understanding the cap and bringing trans or players in, act player acquisition. And I've seen him to where now he has a very, very clear vision of what that looks like. And uh, I think that experience he had in San Francisco Really, just in, in my time knowing Robert and visiting with him, I could see tremendous growth in that. That gives me the confidence because he, he transferred it. And really, now he did it on the defensive side, very involved with player acquisition. Now it's just another, you know, 26 more guys that he has to do it with and lead his staff accordingly. Paul, what was your reaction when you heard the Jets had hired Robert Sala? It's just more than anything, just super excited for Coach Sala because. You know, for, after playing for him um, and understanding the, the, what a, a great man and great person that he was, that he's going to do an unbelievable job leading an entire organization. So super excited for him and his family. You said when you were a linebacker with the Jacksonville Jaguars, you knew that he was not going to be here for long. Why? You just when you looked at him as a, so he, he was our linebacker coach at the time and you looked at him and, and his command presence, the understanding that he had for not only what the linebackers need to do on the field, but the entire defense, the way he was able to communicate things in a crystal clear manner. You said, okay, he's, he's at some point, he's obviously going to be a coordinator and, and go beyond that to, to be a head man. He just, he had that type of presence and, uh, and that type of influence over his players. All right. What about Salah's mantra? All gas, no break. He talked about you uh, as far as where that actually originated. What What is the story behind all gas, no break? I mean, I have to credit him definitely with, with the saying, but when, when he w was coaching our linebacker group in Jacksonville, we just we, we wanted to come up with uh, almost a philosophy of, of how we wanted to play. And that was, you know, we always talk about playing fast, you know, not not only physically, but but mentally that that's even more important. Just being having having a crystal clear mindset and knowing that regardless of what happens on the field, you are going full speed, all out, all the time. And if you make mistakes, you make mistakes, but just make them extremely fast and play as as fast and as physical as you can. And that kind of developed into the the all gas no no break mantra. What was Robert Sala like on game days? I mean, it, it depends on what point in, in the day. You know, obviously. <laughs> You, you, we all see him, you know, on TV as this extremely passionate and, and devoted coach. And, and that's absolutely, absolutely how he was. He has he has a great ability to switch between, you know, what we see on the clips of him on ESPN versus well, now when we're on the sideline and we need to go over a particular play and learn what happened and how to adjust. He can communicate in a calm and clear manner so that his players know exactly what to do. And then when we get back out on the field and something big happens, you, you see that explosion, you know, of emotion and happiness that he has for us. What was his presence and his command? You saw him inside a classroom. Now he'll be speaking to the entire Jets organization at one Jets drive. I mean, he he's he's made for that type of position, you know, in a, in a leadership position where he can influence an entire organization because, um, I mean, he, he's he's trustworthy. He's determined. His guys are devoted to him, and he wants what's best for his players in the organization. So when you put all those together, and with his ability to to communicate clearly and lead, uh, I, I think he's in, he's in a perfect role. Paul, how would you describe his coaching philosophy? Because I know a lot of people have looked of late, of course, at his Ted coaching points. But uh, how would you describe that philosophy in a nutshell? I mean, I think, you know, breaking it all the way down to a, to a player perspective, I know that he there was always the main emphasis was he wanted to create things and teach in a way that made things very clear and simple for his players 
so that they could perform at their highest level on Sunday. He was he was all about helping players develop, learn, and creating the type of environment where they could just strictly focus on ball and play fast on Sunday to do the best job that they could. You just spoke about playing fast. How key was that for him in terms of his approach? Because he's talked about making it simple for players and them just going out and doing their jobs, not overcomplicating things. That That's enormous because from a player's perspective, when you are able to step on the field and you have a crystal clear mindset, you know exactly what to do and how to do it. And there's no second guessing. Do I, you know, what do I read and what, what changes are, are, are being made? When you can eliminate all that, like Coach Sala has been able to do and put a crystal clear mindset in, in a player's mind, that's when you go out and you see guys fly around because there's nothing mentally holding them back. Can you speak to his humility? You know there are a lot of egos in the National Football League, but he comes across as such a humble leader. And then I think we see that, too, when his expertise is on the defensive side of the ball. He just named Jeff Albrecht defensive coordinator, and he said, you're going to call plays. I mean, that, that speaks volumes about him and his personality, the, the way that he was brought up. He just – he – he has, a, he has a strong love and devotion for the people around him. And, and I, I feel like, you know, we, because we both had children at the time, we would often talk about our kids and he would, he would talk about how, you know, some of the, the, the most joyous moments in his life is seeing his kids develop and learn fr from him. And that's the most rewarding experience. Now you apply that same concept to professional football He's going to have the opportunity to help all of his players grow, learn, develop, and get better and, and find the success that they want on the field. And when you have someone dedicated to that, dedicated to others instead of, um, you know, you know the, the importance of himself, that, that's, that's an enormous advantage for the organization. I, I think that the people, the fan base, the people in New York, they're, they're going to love him because they'll love his approach. He's, he's completely dedicated to his job and his family. He's going to work extremely hard. And he's completely honest. He, he's he's not going to to lie, cheat, or deceive. You know, you know, you know, in order to create some some side of some sort of false image, he's going to be completely dedicated to helping the New York Jets win. Do everything he can to do that, and do it in an honest and trustworthy way. Yeah, I, I was shocked. Yeah. Just the way the ball game went down. I thought if Tampa won, it would be a, a fourth quarter game. I thought uh, what we were going to see was. Um, Kansas City scores some points and Tampa try to get there with rushing four and playing numbers in the back end. And they ended up rushing four and playing numbers in the back end, but they completely got after Patrick Mahomes. There was that stat that Patrick Mahomes ran for close to 500 yards before he threw the football on Sunday. That's ridiculous. I think, I think this is the lesson that we kind of alluded to before is that when Eric Fisher, the chief's left tackle went out, that chief's O line had some reshuffling to do. And that bucks defensive line with Shaq Barrett, Jason Pierre, Paul Vita Vea, Steve McClendon included that, that is a tantalizing front. And they really got after Patrick Mahomes. And there are, when you're looking at evaluations in terms of the draft, which is coming up in a couple months and free agency, what you're looking for, there's some lessons to be had there. And it all starts up front, which is what Joe Douglas has been trying to stabilize here with the Jets since he took the job. It's the outstanding point because I'd ask you, if you have a draft tomorrow and you could pick any player in the National Football League, who are you going with? I'm still going with Patrick Mahomes. There you go. You're still going with Patrick Mahomes. But that's this just speaks to the team game the National Football League is. You can't win with one player, even if it's the most important position in the game. Maybe the most important position in all professional sports. You have to win up front. And Tampa repeatedly won up front, getting after Mahomes. They basically dared the Chiefs to run. And I was surprised that the Chiefs didn't counter with more of a running game themselves. Mm -hmm. And uh, we oftentimes saw Mahomes running for his life. On the other side of the ball, Tampa's numbers, if you look at them, not staggering, but they had a consistent run game. And we thought going into this ball game, the second matchup 
of the year between the Buccaneers and the Chiefs. They were going to have to stay out of third and long. And the Buccaneers didn't convert a crazy percentage on third down, but they did run the football. And how about Leonard Fournette, a guy who kind of went under the radar during the season. He played really well in this title game. And uh, Tom Brady, efficient as ever. Who, (laughs) again, Brady, two touchdown passes to Rob Gronkowski, and then one to Just like old times. Yeah, and then one one to Antonio Brown. Those are those are two guys who came to Tampa and they followed Tom Brady there. And then, like you mentioned, Leonard Fournette was midseason, or maybe it was just before the season when the Jaguars wave released him, and he joins Tampa. Also, I mean, I was on a side note. Lashawn McCoy's on that team. He didn't take a snap on offense, but Shady's on that team. He <laughs> back to back rings without taking a snap in the Super Bowl. So. He's collecting rings and it's good for him because he's one of the, one of the most electrifying players in his prime. And, you know, I I think kind of what we're talking about earlier, when you, when you think of the NFL and how it's a copycat league and Daniel Jeremiah tweeted about what evaluators can learn from this game. And obviously you think of the battle in the trenches between the offensive and defensive line, but one position that he mentioned was having a fast linebacker who can cover. And I think that he was alluding to the performance of Devin White, the second-year player out of LSU, because Devin White was all over the place. And then putting this into a Jets perspective, the Jets now are going to have mostly a 4-3 front. Mm -hmm. So you would expect that they're going to have to add some speed to that room. Yeah. Listen, there's only so many Devin Whites out there. Uh, he an incredible player, a young talent. He's only played in the NFL for two years, like you just mentioned. He's only going to get better. That's scary to think about it. And going back to the Buccaneers, this was year one with Brady leading the way. I think a lot of people thought that ultimately they would be better in their second year with Brady. So that's kind of scary to think about from an <laughs> NFC perspective. But yeah. To your point about the Jets, you run in that 4-3, you're going to need speed at the linebacker position. You know, we talk about the Bozlesny interview. Um, That's what Salah wants in a mindset, but also from a physical skill set, I think the Jets are going going to be looking to add more speed to that position you would anticipate if you just look at the way the 49ers have played defense over the years. You go back to the Jaguars and then, uh, you think about Seattle and the way that defense was built. So you, you, you ultim- ultimately think about speed on the inside and then those longer physical corners on the outside. Um, but it's going to be interesting to see how these guys do attack this offseason, the first true offseason together for Joe Douglas and Robert Sala and and Jeff Albrick and uh, Michael Fleur on the other side of the ball. But uh yeah, there's only so many Devin Whites, but it is a speed game, especially if you're playing against somebody like the Chiefs, who features perhaps the most dynamic weapon in all of football, Tyreek Hill. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that the Jets are definitely in the market for speed, whether that's free agency, trade, draft. You kind of got the sense listening to Coach Sala speak and the way he was describing the LaFleur offense and what we know about the four, three defense. I think that the jets are definitely in the market for speed. And before we wrap up here on the official jets pod powered by AWS, obviously the super bowl kind of puts a, a cap on the season as the off season looms. But I'm just curious, what was your spread? Like your COVID spread? Because obviously in typical world, you'd like to have people over. You'd like to go to a super bowl party, have a giant spread, you know, chips and dip and everything. But what was the Eric Allen super bowl? spread and no part no parties here i just had the, the family here and um they had some chicken wings from wagman's the wagman's nice. has invaded new jersey over the last few <laughs> years it, it used to be like a western new york central new york thing um so so those were tremendous also had a buffalo uh chicken uh, uh patty or burger and and a couple adult pops that sounds like a good spread we had a yeah. uh, Pigs in a blanket, homemade, where you buy the crescent rolls and you cut up the hot dogs, not the pre-bought stuff. Then uh, we had to pivot because of some unforeseen weather. 
or the the weather kind of limited us. So we went with a Domino's pizza and I loved it. <laughs> Domino's pizza, man. I haven't had Domino's <laughs> pizza in a long time. Uh, it used to hit that up quite a bit uh, during my college run. In fact, I go back to my days at Canisius College, my freshman year, way back when there used to be a place called uh, Two for One. You know, it, it literally is called Two for One. So you could get a couple pizzas for nine or 10 bucks. I love that. Hey, and I will say Domino's, it's for me, it's thin crust only. And that's the good stuff. Uh, thin crust it has to be, it's got to be that way all the time. When I went to Chicago, you try the deep dish, it's like having a plate of lasagna or something. That's fine. But to me, that's not pizza. I second uh, that. Pizza? Yeah. The thin crust. And if you're here locally in the Florham Park area, there are a couple uh, very good establishments. Yeah, uh, Get the grandma's pie from specifically Nona's, right in florida yeah, park but, but uh, they have their name on this podcast <laughs> i'm invited i just invited them to have their name on the podcast <laughs> okay yeah, yeah yeah if Nona's comes on board they can they can sponsor here but uh, yeah i'm a big believer in their grandma's pie that's one All of the right. better, better pizzas out there you're a new oh. york guy so if we're in new york in manhattan give me top two top three Oh wow! Now, now we got some competition in terms yep. of uh, in terms of pizza. Um, number one for me is Angelo's Pizzeria on fifty. It's on fifty seventh, I think, between six and seven. That's nope. that's to me the you can only get get it by the pie. That to me is the establishment. The square or triangle, triangle slices, okay. thick cut pepperoni. You know they have yep. so it has a little bit of heat to it. And then if you want a, like a thicker piece out in in brooklyn is a place called spumoni gardens and that is like it i don't know if you'd like it because it's um it's thicker pieces and their pepperoni is great and prince street pizza same similar similar cut thick square slice thick cut pepperoni awesome all right enough about pizza it's making me hungry but bottom line here is though the nfl season officially over tampa bay buccaneers champions um the jets a lot of work to do this off season we had some great content coming out of the senior bowl even though we weren't able to go there this mm -hmm. year the next step in the process is going to be the combine even though it's not the combine that we have been accustomed to over the years they're still going to be doing physicals at multiple spots and we'll have to find out how that's all breaking down but we we are going to talk to Jets personnel throughout the off season here, not only on the podcast, but all our platforms and uh, free agency, not too far in the distance now, Greens. No, March it's, 17th. It's going to come in real hot. That's also St. Patrick's Day, isn't it? So Yes, it is. St. Patrick's so Day was also the day that the Jets a few years back moved up from six to three. Yep. I, I remember that. So some teams might be celebrating on St on St. Patrick's Day. Some teams may not be. And we'll find out in a little over a month. And that's how we close out this edition of the Official Jets Podcast, powered by AWS. Make sure to rate us, review us, subscribe to us, and we'll see you next week.